Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, everyone. You're joining us from all over the world. Um, today, we have the second um, series of our Humane Artificial Intelligence webinar series um, with the topic of applications of AI in business, industry, government, healthcare, and environment. This uh, webinar series has been um, sponsored by IEEE Maine Communication Society and Computer Society Joint Chapter, as well as IEEE Region 1 in Northeast US and promoted by IEEE USA. So we have three speakers today. Um, each speaker will make the presentation and then after all three are over, we will have around 10, 15 minutes for um, answering your questions. So in the during the presentations, you can use the Q&A feature to post your questions, um, and you can do that through the entire presentations, and toward the end, we'll go through that Q&A to answer your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Mohamed Musavi, Associate Dean of the College of Engineering and Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Maine. Prior to his current position, he was the chair of the ECE department, um, Dr. Musavi received his MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from University of Michigan. He has over 35 years of experience in engineering education and research in the areas of a smart grid, power systems, and intelligence system, including neural networks, robotics, and computer vision. Dr. Musavi is the recipient of IEEE USA Engineer and Educator Partnership Award, and I would like to invite him to the podium to start us off with his talk. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Ali, for the introduction. I'm going to start sharing my um, screen. Okay, I, ho I hope everybody can see my screen. And again, I want to uh, thank everybody and also Ali for the introduction and the opportunity to share my experiences in artificial neural network, an area that I have been involved in for the past 30 years. I have enjoyed working in this area um, because of its connection to human intelligence and its applicability to any area where you need to learn from data. Over the past 30 years, this area has grown tremendously and we can see its applications in many aspects of our lives and there are many more to come. So um, what are neural networks and why are they important? The idea is to create a computer system to mimic human intelligence. Human brain is a massive network of 80 to 100 billion neurons that are highly interconnected and act at a level of sophistication yet unknown to human. On the other hand, the latest computer processors are made of 8 billion processing nodes, but can work at a much faster speed in the order of several trillion operations per second. The question is, how can we learn from our biological neuron systems to create artificial intelligence in machines? So, Let's consider a biological neuron as shown on the left. The main parts of this cell as, relate, as relates to our work are the dendrites on the bottom left inputting signals to the cell nucleus that processes the signals or information. The axon that transmits the information from one cell to the others and the synaptic connections that identify how much information is passed from one cell to another. One very simple artificial presentation of such a neuron is given on the right, identifying the four important functions of a biological neuron. The input information via dendrites are shown by X, vector X, the synaptic strength or weights are shown by W. The nucleus processing action is shown by a function 
um, phi of sigma and the axon that carries the information from one cell to the others. Here is an artificial neural network made from the interconnection of many nodes, the simple nodes I described in the previous slide. This is the popular feedforward network, which has been around since the 40s, more than a decade before the invention of digital computers and rule-based artificial intelligence. However, the work was almost forgotten due to lack of a learning process. It was in the mid 80s that the supervised backpropagation learning algorithm was developed to train such a network. From the functionality point of view, a neural network can be viewed as a black box to use data as its input and provide knowledge as output, as its output. If you are the manager of an operation, you may be interested in knowing what you can learn from your available data. But if you are the one who are going to do the task, it is important that you learn the topic before implementing any network. I'm pleased to inform you that we do offer an artificial, uh, artificial neural network course here at the University of Maine. So we talked about being able to create knowledge from a neural network. Human intelligence comes in the form of recognizing things that we have seen in the past. For example, recognizing a person or being able to group things like being able to distinguish a car from a truck or an airplane from a submarine we are also able to interpolate data and predict the future. For example, if we see sufficient but incomplete data from an object, we may be able to state what that object is. Or if we observe the path of a hurricane or know of the other, and know of the other factors affecting it, we can predict where it's going to go next. So I have categorized the knowledge provided by a neural network into four categories, classification, clustering, function approximation, and prediction. For every one of these categories, I have prepared um, one example that um, I will present next. Before, before giving the examples, Let's go over different steps in developing uh, reliable neural networks. First, we need to design the network architecture or a network architecture, which involves defining the number of inputs, outputs, nodes, and their interconnections. Next is to train the network with a section of the data available to us followed by verifying that the network is capable of doing its job using the other section of the data. And finally, testing the network with unseen data that has not been used um, in the training or verification processes. I should say training and verification processes, not all. The first example I present here is a supervised classification uh, to identify chromosomes in a cell. This work was done in collaboration with the Jackson lab. And to the left, you will see mouse chromosomes in a cell under the microscope. The task is to identify all chromosomes and arrange them in an organized karyotype on the left for scientists to review. The input data to the network can be an image or features of a chromosome. We completed this job with 88% accuracy at a time where there was not any software to do the job. 
And if you Google my last name, Musavi, M-U-S-A-V-I, and mouse chromosomes, you will find a scientific paper describing this work. This example is also in the medical field, and the task is prediction and identification of DNA bases, which are A, C, G, and T, given the DNA electrophoresis gel image. As shown on the left, through the use of neural network, we not only predicted where the next base should occur, but also predicted what it should be with over 98% accuracy. To the right, you will see the output of the software that we developed for this automated process. We call it trace tool. The green bars show the level of confidence in the identification of the bases. It is very important, the confidence level is very important. Um, so again, if you Google up um, my name and uh, DNA base calling, um, you will see this work described in a paper. Further description of the job. So uh, this application presents an unsupervised learning. We were given digital terrain elevation data, or in short, DTED, D-T-E-D, from a region, and asked to identify the watershed, the watershed areas of the data. Um, we designed a neural network, and what you see on the right is the output of the network showing the watershed areas in the um, image. In addition to the obvious lakes and brooks, the network also identified the possible flood areas after high rain or melting snow, especially during the spring, um, early spring time. The aerial image of this same area is also shown uh, and given here for um, verification. The network did a pretty good job. The pictures under the black box are different stages of neural network learning process. Um, here is the background for a continuous process industry where raw materials are entered from one end, the left, and the final product comes out from the other end on the bottom right. We have historically had many pulp and paper plants in Maine, but you can find similar continuous processes in oil industries, flooring, ceiling, tiles, and many others, where the quality of raw material is constantly changing due to the type and location of the raw materials used. In a pulp and paper industry, raw materials could come from a variety of trees and a number of localities, but the final paper product should always have consistent properties. While we worked on digester, refining and bleaching as I shown to you in the previous um, slide. Um, here, I'm only using two very important quality measures um, at the end of this continuous process, when the final product, which is paper here, comes out. These measures are brightness and opacity. Um, the top picture shows real brightness data in red. The red again is real data that is coming out of the plant. And the blue information um, overimposed on the red is the prediction of the neural network um, as what 
the brightness should be one hour in advance. Um, similar results have been presented for opacity below. Why is it important to predict? Because the operators can make corrective actions to ensure that the paper quality is satisfactory at all times and there is no waste in the process. Exactly in the same way that is important to predict the path of a tornado or hurricane. So in conclusion, and in the last 30 years, we have worked on many other applications in the energy sector, smart grid, utilities, and NASA satellite imaging, imagery. Um, in fact, as I mentioned before, if you Google my last name and neural networks in general, you would see, I would say, about 60 to 70 scientific papers related to our works and whichever is of interest to you, you can study. Um, below are some other examples. And that is why these days you will notice a significant surge in AI applications. I would end my presentation by stating that wherever there is data, neural networks can provide insight into the process or event. Here at the University of Maine, we do have expertise to help our state organizations, industries, nonprofits, and others to gain knowledge from their data. So with that, I am ending my presentation. Thank you for the time to listening to me. And my contact information is given as musavi at main.edu. Thank you again, Ali. Thank you very much, Dr. Musavi, for the great presentation. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this um, talk, if you're joining us a little bit late, um, if you missed the first talk, we're going to post the recording later on on the Human AI website. Um, and the series is sponsored by IEEE as well as University of Maine. So let's go on to the next talk as our next speaker is sharing his talks. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Owen McCarthy, president and co-founder of MedRhythms, a digital therapeutic company that uses sensors, music, and software to build evidence-based neurologic intervention to measure um, and improve walking. Owen has become a leader in the field of digital therapeutics. Uh, Medritem, a member of Digital Therapeutic Alliance, is developing evidence-based FDA-regulated devices to treat, manage, and diagnose neurological injuries and diseases. Since founding Medritem in 2016, Owen has been invited to speak at digital therapeutics conferences and events across the country, including DTX West, DTX East, Neurotech Investing and Partnering Conference, Partners, Connected Health Conference, HLTH, Evercore, ISI panel. So without further ado, I would like to um, invite Owen to the podium to start his talk. All right. Really thrilled to be here and uh, glad all of you could join us from all over the world. Um, you know, I'm a, as Ali said, I'm a proud UMAN alum and really glad that there's a lot of activity going on, um, on in cutting edge innovation and always thrilled to hear from you know, people like Dr. Musavi um, on their work and, and things that are going on at our, our university. So today my plan is to talk um, a little bit about how AI is being used in sort of regulated healthcare. You know, there's a lot of applications that I'm not gonna talk about where, you know, AI is being used in sort of drug development or defining care pathways or, you know, even at, you know, better understanding DNA and, and our genetic makeup. And so those will not be part of my talk today. But what I'm really going to be talking about is what I'm seeing, you know, both through the Digital Therapeutics Alliance at MedRhythms and, you know, with my colleagues in the field for things that directly treat, manage, or diagnose disease that require uh, some sort of FDA approval um, and oversight, you know, because those are, you know, there's some super fascinating trends going on there. And so, as you know, I mean, you see headlines all the time that some of them might scare you about 
how the machines might be taking jobs or, or these things are coming and, you know, will physicians be obsolete? And rest assured, you know, I don't believe um, that physicians will be obsolete and, and these things, you know, the, the things that are coming will, will take all the jobs. But, you know, I, you know what, what's really happening, what, what we're really seeing is we're seeing a couple of different things in, in the, the field. And we're seeing physicians and doctors and clinicians and other people in, in healthcare becoming more effective because of assistive AI tools, um, which I'll talk about some of them. And then there's some autonomous AI that is coming out that makes things more efficient, though those right now have larger challenges, both in terms of um, approval pathways from the FDA and in terms of how it changes how products are, are paid for um, and reimbursed. And so here you'll find a chart that Nature just published actually, and I think it was maybe last month for all of the FDA approvals for you know, intelligence-based devices in medicine. Um, and you'll notice actually that um, the majority of them actually fall in that radiology bucket um, because as we know, you know, the systems that Dr. Musavi was talking about have been proven actually pretty well at understanding imaging and doing image recognition. And in radiology, there's a lot of images to understand. And so that's where you're seeing the majority of the, the work these days. Um, you know, but to break it down even further, you know, there has been 29 products approved by the FDA that include AI and machine learning. Eight of these do use a deep learning approach. 21 of them are in radiology. Um, and these, these products um, are, are sort of um, across the board where you know, the AI is actually being adapted in real time um, you know, to change the outputs of the algorithms, or there's a step, stepwise approach where you know, the live version of the algorithm that might detect what's happening on the image in the radiology is locked. But in the background, there's a ML AI system that's making it better. They'll do a set of quality checks and then they'll re-release another locked version of an algorithm in sort of a process. And to date, each of those sort of um, setups have been negotiated sort of on a one-off basis um, with the FDA. I'm gonna spend maybe a little bit of time trying to make it um, more concrete um, and talk about sort of use cases in dermatology. And this information and a lot of this comes from, um, you know, one of my colleagues um, who's at Digital Diagnostics, who, who's, who's educated me a lot about in dermatology, how AI can be used. And it's not just take a picture of your skin and diagnose if you have cancer or not. So, you know, if you think about um, teledermatology and, and, and if you have some sort of something that's happening on your skin and you know, I actually do have something I have to get checked out, which hopefully it's, it's nothing bad. But if you have something on your skin, the flow in healthcare is often, you go to your primary care doc um, who will check it out, give it a first pass. Then you get put into a, maybe a remote dermatologist to take a look in COVID times, or you go immediately to an in-person dermatologist. Some of the challenges might be that, you know, to schedule a visit in some parts of the country, um, with a dermatologist, it might take six to 12 months, but some conditions that you detect may be more lethal in that time frame. And so a, a first um, sort of pass for AI-based systems is they're starting to be rolled out in 3Derm, this company I was talking about does this, um, in primary care where they'll take an image when you come into the office and then quality check if the image is good of quality in the beginning before it gets sent to a remote derm to triage to see, you know, see what makes the most sense. The next level of that is if you add the, the AI in um, after that quality checkpoint at the primary care office, it can sort of be like an urgent expediter where it says, this is melanoma or this is a, a basal cell. Please see a dermatologist immediately. Um, or and it might, you know, it's as Dr. Musavi said, it's probably a, it's 80% likely this or 70% likely this, you know, there's some sort of threshold though there um, that, that it has to hit to get over that point to jump the line. And then a real dermatologist can make the call. And you'll see this a lot and, and it continues to be more of a trend for how, how these sort of things roll out. But the next case is, and this is what they're working on at Digital Diagnostics is, um, you know, 
the auto triage where, where the, the FDA would approve an algorithm that says, you know, this can diagnose this condition, this condition, and this condition. Um, and if um, that image is taken, um, whether it be at primary care or in home, though there's some challenges, more challenges there, that it can jump the line with the system that takes, you know, a learning approach to, to, to drive someone directly to, um, to an in-person uh, dermatologist. Um, so those are, those are some of the types of things that, that you know, we're seeing, you know, there's, there's also um, applications where there's this company called IDX that has a, um, you know, eye image software that can automatically detect diabetic and retinopathy that really, um, you know, kind of follows the same path uh, where it can take a, an image and then triage it and said and diagnose you with that and then get you to the right care at the right time. In all of these cases, you know, there's still a human in the loop, um, you know, at some point down the line, they might be remote instead of in person, but, but there's still a human in a lot of the loop because there's, it's more complicated than that, like one uh, niche area that's being uh, diagnosed. And, and, you know, that will likely sort of flex over time, but it's, it's, you know, it's important because if you think about, I mean, I don't know, um, you know, all you're familiar with the healthcare, but if you pick a profession in healthcare, uh, nurses or probably radiologists or physical therapists, you know, there's always a shortage. You know, every area, particularly in rural man, particularly where it is, there's a shortage of them. They're always booked out um, a long time. And so tools that can either make them better, make sort of individual diagnosis that get that can better treat patients or better diagnose patients um, will not only help, you know, they're not gonna replace jobs, they're gonna really alleviate sort of the tension of we need, you know, 40%, 25% more physical therapists or other things like that. So, so it's, it's a really exciting time, you know, as, as these come and help, you know, these tools become, you know, the tools that, that have been invented since the 40s, as Dr. Masavi said, and then, you know, took hold in the 80s, and now computing power allows us to do them better in real world now are coming to fruition. You know, they're really changing the landscape. You know, some of the considerations, though, you know, if you were to look at from a, you know, taking it to market, or if you're building technology in a market that, that, you know, still need to be sorted out are, you know, there are some, you know, there, there's sort of five of them that I think need to be sorted out, um, you know, across this spectrum. And, and, you know, there's some instances where, um, you know, where real world clinical data is messy, um, because uh, the inputs, you know, the differences between the image that's taken makes all the difference whether or not something is detected in something like a hair or something else in the, the image on the skin could really change how some of the algorithms really detect. So, you know, what 3DARM found was, you know, their, their goal would be to get the webcam, the camera here that, you know, for the, for the picture to be used for the, um, you know, for the input. However, for now, they're, they're doing a more controlled approach in a primary care office because they found that the quality wasn't as good, maybe, uh, maybe a generation or two before, you know, some of the phones that came out and, and because of the data coming in. And so, you know, that's a real constraint on any system is the, the, the quality of the inputs, particularly as you put it in the real world. Um, and then, you know, next is there's actually a whole class of products that are coming out and trying to go around um, the FDA regulation, which some of it might be good and some of it might be bad, but what they're doing is they're taking data, providing information, giving it to a non-specialist and allowing them to try to make a determination based on that. Some of them could, and, and some of it may be okay, but the more you do that, the more likely you, you, you maybe lose control over some of the regulated nature that may be necessary if you're really de dealing with life or death or someone's health. And so that's something to keep an eye out, particularly as you might find uh, bad actors or, or people that, that, that don't you know, understand the quality controls on healthcare. Um, the other one is back to inputs is, you know, there is, there's a real challenge across even clinical trials. But if you think about 
you know, AI driven dermatology that there's a lack of diversity in terms of the, the, the pictures and things that have been uh, training these algorithms. And so you, you really would, you wouldn't want to leave by, you know, behind ethnic groups or other groups in terms of, you know, how they're being treated. And so it's something to really put some thought behind both on the, you know, if you're a policy person on the policy angle as, as, and how to, how to be inclusive in the development of these technologies, or if you're a technologist, and you're developing, you know, software that that uses these things that you, you really think about how inputs could be different and how treatment could be different based on someone's, um, you know, background. So that's something that, you know, needs more um, sort of more focus. And then finally, I did mention, you know, nine, there's, you know, there's been nine, 29 approvals through the FDA each of those have sort of been negotiated separately in terms of how you set up the frameworks for regulating the algorithms. Um, they, the FDA right now is coming out with a, with what they call a document, a framework document that they published as a draft last year and it should finalize soon that talks about sort of how as a manufacturer of software, a builder of software that uses AI in treating, diagnosing or managing diseases um, you can set up frameworks to be able to allow it to adapt and change and not have to meet with them, you know, over and over again to individually come up with a plan for that, sort of come up with a blueprint. So that's something to watch and that will, could drive innovation. I will mention, you know, the FDA has actually been pretty forward thinking as it relates to software as a medical device and, and AI based systems and just created a center for digital health. Uh, excellence, I think last week, and they're really, I mean, they, they're really thoughtful in this regard, but also, you know, take, keep in mind the, um, you know, that, that there's an efficacy and safety risk and benefits for patients that needs to be evaluated, um, you know, through these processes. Um, but they're, they're, they're definitely forward thinking there. And then finally, I think the last frontier, one of the last frontiers to say, will these type of systems scale in a way in healthcare and really transform is how things get paid for. You know, the, if you think about, I mean, we're, we're now maybe outside of like you know, tech and AI, but if you think about a system, you know, the back to those scare tactics in, in the articles that says, are the systems coming for your job? Well, no, is my answer, because there's plenty of flex there. However, you know, the way healthcare gets paid for is really set up by in the US by insurance companies, public and private. And they have really rigid rules around what can get reimbursed and by who. And if a software system is doing the full diagnosis of melanoma, and but the treatment might go to a dermatologist, you need to create new ways for incentives for like you getting paid for that versus getting paid for a clinician's time for, for that. And if you do that improperly, you could put you could put the the technology up against the clinician and make them make turn it into a policy lobbying war instead of a what's better for the patient and so you know medicare medicaid is thinking about this and so are private insurers but it's going to be you know i think you get that figured out right you're going to see a lot more innovation in this space so that's um you know that's my you know my quick sort of view of what i'm seeing in in the real world look for the q a period and Thankful for the opportunity to talk, Ali. Thank you very much, Owen, for the interesting talk. Um, again, those who are joining us uh, late, all of these talks will be recorded and posted on the Human AI website. Um, please don't forget to post your question on the Q&A feature, and we'll answer those questions uh, right after the next talk. So our third and last talk for today is delivered by Dr. Somaye Khosrozad. Uh, she received her BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering from Ferdowsi University of Mashhad in 2006 and 2009, and her PhD degree from University of Birjand in 2017. From 2018 to 2020, uh, she was a signal processing specialist at Activos Diagnostics and a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Maine. She's currently liberal visiting diversity professor at UMA. Her research interests include theory and development of wireless communication system, wireless sensor networks, artificial intelligence techniques, modeling, analyzing, and optimizing 
new wireless system. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Khosraza to the podium. Thanks very much. Thank you for the introduction. And let me share my screen. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. That is depending on which times you're in. The subject that I want to talk about that is the applications of AI in healthcare and environment. As you know, artificial intelligence or AI refers to a computer imitating intellectual processes characteristic of humans to learn from past experiences and reach goals without being explicitly programmed for a specific result. Today, AI is one of the most attractive subjects that all over the science world talk about and try to solve problems with this new tool. There is no doubt that AI is a strong tool to escape some of the disabilities or weaknesses of human beings to solving in solving complex or very time consuming problems. In many areas, however, much work needs to be done to bring out AI from papers or simulations to the real world. The most basic or perhaps the simplest perception that the general public has of artificial intelligence is face recognition or a little more general case image processing or speech or voice recognition, meaning that there are some algorithms uh, in which the computer is trained to classify data after receiving some information and prototypes and then for any new data it tracks the pattern which has been trained with it to detect the classification of the new data. However, this is, this is definitely not the most impressive attraction of AI. What makes it the most attention gallery is that it is uh, pervasive in all, science, in all sciences and a, um, a wide range of applications. Here, given the limited time that I have, I just want to focus briefly on the application of artificial intelligence in wireless communications, wireless sensor networks, and healthcare applications. We all know that uh, the world is moving toward Internet of Things or IoT, a world in which wireless sensor networks continuously exchange information among a large number of devices, and all these devices work simultaneously. And the goal is monitoring and controlling some specific parameters in the systems. Obviously, for such applications, AI conceptually could be a tremendously useful tool for increasing the speed of processing data, as well as decreasing costs and energy. However, one important question is how much today and in the near future AI is powerful and trustable to be applied for more serious application, uh, applications in the real world. Let me categorize AI problems from a specific view to two groups. Some specific problems in which a huge amount of data is collected and AI, supervised or unsupervised, tries to classify the data to multiple groups by finding one or more thresholds or some limits based on all statistical and probabilistic logics that are predefined for it. In such matters, uh, in such matters AI directly force fit the data. In this case, the distinctive feature of artificial intelligence is its accuracy and its speed to search for all possibilities and choose the best solution, considering again some predefined general statistical criteria. There is another type of AI applications, however, in which some kind of pre processing needs to be done before using AI. It means that the classification is not done on data directly, but it is done on some other features that should be extracted from the data first. And for extracting these features, a sort of knowledge and expertise beyond AI is required. I would like to clarify this latter case with an example from our sleep monitoring project, which is being done at Activos Diagnostics Company in collaboration with two engineering and psychology groups. In this project, an sleep move device uh, is used, which is a wireless device commercialized by Activos Diagnostics. 
This device is capable of collecting data from various types of piezoresistive sensors deployed in a network to improve the dynamic range of sensor arrays and satisfy the requirements of feature detection and extraction from the collected neuromotor signals. Hardware and software integrate movement and respiration variability using a fast neuromotor bout detection algorithm. Obviously, there are some pre-processing and screening data stages that should be done first, like denoising and choosing the most informative data among the data achieved from all sensors at each moment. But after that, the question is what we have and what we are looking for. What we have is body movement signals during the sleep, and what we are looking for is early detection of Alzheimer's disease. In such a situation, the body movement signals depend on so many different factors that even physicians cannot make any prospect about the result. Factors like age, weight, position of the body during a sleep, which is based on the habits of different people and a lot more. In hospital sleep studies, utilizing many non-EEG signals to characterize a sleep disorder like eye and body movements, respiratory frequency or volume, cardiac variability, and so on, show there is a strong relation, a relationship between sleep disorders and neurological status. And fragmented sleep results in the impairment of cognitive function or disrupt autonomic nervous system regulatory processes during the sleep periods. However, there is no definitive algorithm to assist in diagnostics. In such situations, in such a situation uh, where pure data have a very high dispersion compared to the amount of variable available data, and uh, there is no statistically direct relationship between the data and the desired output, this is necessary to first extract. Uh, some more informative and relevant features from the pure data and then use AI tools to classify these features. What we did for this project is the whole two nice data are separated into 10 minutes epochs with, uh, epochs with one minute overlap. This windows, uh, window size is chosen based on the number of sleep-related spontaneous movements uh, with a periodicity of three to five minutes, yielding two to three events in each 10 minutes epoch. Then, considering the properties of spontaneous movement signals and respiratory signals, which was taken from expertise of psychologists and physicians, some filters were de designed to separately extract respiratory and movement signals from the raw data. The next step was extracting important features from these two signals. Movements induce physiological upregulation of cardiorespiratory rate to maintain homeostasis, a process that may be indexed by the respiratory rate change. The first analysis tracks the similarity of the changes in these two signals. In other words, to see how movement and respiratory signals affect each other, the correlation, the correlation uh, between them is calculated. In general, correlation describes the mutual relationship which exists between two or more signals. The cross correlation of the two signals is maximum at the time that equals to time lag. This time lag is considered as an important feature. Some other features then are like sleep duration and fragmentation estimates or maximum amplitude, which were presumed to be related to brain activities, were extracted and then these features plus some other information like age and weight uh, were used as the inputs of the AI tools and now this extracted information could be used as the input of AI tools to be processed and classified. And as you can see, now by using this processing algorithm, AI could give us 
88% accuracy in early detection of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, in general, what I want uh, to highlight is AI is a strong tool for deep learning, but as they say, it, is not have, it does not have necessarily a deep side for solving the problems. What do we need for make it more applicable and trustable for the real world is to learn how to make right connections among experience, expertise, and AI tools. Thank you for hearing me and um, I'm looking forward to any question you have and let me, thank you, Ali. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khosrazad, for the great presentation. I'm glad to see we had a very uh, sort of wide range of applications kind of covered today. So hopefully that inspires you to ask some uh, relevant questions. Um, we started from Dr. Musavi's talk, which was basically the history of humane work in neural network and the basic and fundamentals of AI, kind of gives you an idea of what people need to learn to be able to retool for future jobs. And then we had um, new applications that Owen um, covered for us. And then the final um, applications that um, Somaya was talking about is basically moving up to the direction of personalized healthcare and um, using AI for different kind of um, diagnostic. So let's get into the Q&A session. Again, if you have questions, don't post them in the chat window, just post them in the Q&A session. And I will start with the first question here. And all the panelists, you can um, uh, maybe turn on your video so you can answer live. Uh, I'm directing the first question to Owen McCarthy. Uh, the question is from Jared. You talked about AI as a job modifier without much effect on the number of jobs in the healthcare field. Could you talk about what kind of maintenance these AI systems require and would they require specialized roles within an organization to train and maintain? Yeah, good. Thanks, Ali and Jared. Thank you for your question. You know, I think um, I will say I don't have a crystal ball to say how it's all going to play out. So I would love everyone else's thoughts on this as well. But, you know, I think where the specialized roles will fall will be likely with the manufacturers. And I put that in quotes because they're building software. So, you know, they're, they're software development manufacturers. Um, you know, there's going to be um, a heavier need on, you know, their, you know, if you think about the traditional quality engineering group that you'd have at uh, so in a software shop, there's going to be someone that's on the teams that are really crossing over from quality engineering for the software, but also on the regulatory side and has the combined knowledge. And so I can see that as a specialized role um, in an organization. And then what's it mean on the healthcare people and their jobs? You know, that's, it's gonna be an interesting one to see how it plays out because, you know, will it mean they'll get to spend more time with their patients sort of on, a, you know, and, and start having to, you know, right now it's a very like, structured, you have 10 minutes, you come in, you have 10 more minutes, you come in, would they have more time to work on lifestyle changes or other things at the clinical level because some of these other things will be taken away? Maybe will it allow for services like Lavongo, et cetera, to offer full digital connected care, no matter where you are, like th that's an also a trend. So in which then the jobs might turn into some more remote jobs or more, you know, clinicians that, that understand different data streams that can make better decisions on them coming through. So Jared, I don't know the exact answer to your, your question, but I, there, there's some, there's definitely some threads that, um, you know, that will change, but I think the real for related to AI, I think the, the specialized roles will rely within them will be exist within the manufacturers likely of the, the products. Thank you, Owen. And while we have you here on video, let me ask you another question before we go to the other panelists. Um, so there is also another question from Marie. What is your company's experience with FDA and CMS? Yeah, no, thank you. So we, we have had, I think, eight um, interactions and maybe nine now with the FDA related to our, our initial product, which is helping people improve their walking following stroke. Um, it's in our pivotal trial stage. And those interactions have been in like a, what they call a pre-submission meeting. So you meet with them to get their buy-in about the approach that you're taking. And so 
we in and, and to do that you have a host of consultants and other folks that you you work with and 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 it's been um very collaborative very positive we were we were fortunate enough earlier this year to get breakthrough designation for our stroke product um which which means that the fda believes it could better treat and um, an irreversibly debilitating disease uh, more effectively with a full unmet need there. So that was thought that was helpful. And then on the CMS side, you know, we've, you know, the more you know about healthcare, you realize the less you know, but we've been diving in um, to, uh, you know, the, is, is there a code? Like how do you get paid? Like how does it fit into the legal requirements? And, and, and we, we've got, sort of we've done some analysis sees with people that used to work with at CMS and then also with internal teams for how the product could roll out. We just we've also been able to comment on a rule that just got released that will automatically reimburse for breakthrough status designation products for approval for four years from CMS, which we believe that could be really positive for our stroke product. Um, and we so on the policy side, we've been working with that. So it's a policy slash um, you know, uh, strategy angle with CMS, but we've had some interactions there. But as I might have mentioned, uh, you know, Mar for Marie, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk about all these things offline as well. Thank you very much, Owen. So next question is for um, Somaya. Um, so what is the impact of AI with next generation communications networks? Uh, sure. I was just typing the answer for this question because I saw the question and uh, I can say it has definitely a great impact on uh, the next generation because uh, most uh, important, the most important topic of the next generation is, as I told, Internet of Things. When um, sensor networks, wireless sensor networks, has a really important uh, role in this subject and when different um, devices are working, are working uh, with each other simultaneously and they want to exchange their information and we need to control and uh, monitor different parameters in such a big and large network, uh, AI can help a lot because it is an intelligence, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and it can, it should be actually designed in somehow that uh, can be estimate some specific changes in this network and uh, give us some good estimations about future and how these uh, devices work with each other without controlling by human beings directly. Uh, the AI tools need to be designed for such a great and large network to uh, do the best for controlling and monitoring this, such a system. Very good, thank you very much, uh, Samai. So next question is for Dr. Musavi. It's a long question, so um, basically um, it refers that you're teaching to the neural network to the students. Um, recently we have pretty solid solutions for deep neural network and machine learning in general over cloud, whereas the machine learning looks like a plug and play of some blocks. If the goal is to prepare our students for job market, do we still need to teach them theories and concept, or do we need to teach them how to work with these cloud-based cloud applications? I mean, do we need to teach them how to use Python libraries and so on, or we need to focus on how to use cloud-based systems? Thank you, Ali, and thank you for the question. Yeah, that's a very important question. It depends on what you are looking at. Of course, cloud computing um, and available software is important to use, but we have gone through this many times in the past that people use available software online and provide their data to the system and they don't get the result that they want. And of course, um, I try to avoid using this terminology, but some people call it garbage in, garbage out if you do not have the knowledge of how the system is working, then you, the result that you may get, you just looking at it from a dark point of view, not having inside information. Therefore, I suggest that 
again, um, if you have an application and if you want to give it to cloud computing or available software, go for it. Um, if it gives you the result that you want, you're all set. You don't need that knowledge. However, if you are encountering difficulty, honestly, you need to go ahead and um, have at least a, a knowledge of neural network. Um, so that is what my experience has been. Uh, I think I, I don't want people to lose their trust in neural network because not knowing how to handle it. Um, and at the same time, I think you want to tune to our next presentation. I believe Ali is next week or uh, next month, next month when we have one of our faculty members talks about deep learning and big data. Uh, and that's so we offer both courses. We offer courses in application oriented and we also offer courses in um, what's under the engine, what's under the hood. So hopefully I was able to answer your question. And again, as I said, over my 30 years, I have gone through this process many times. I had people who said, I don't need this knowledge and I can go ahead and use this. But then after a couple of months, a month came back to me and said, this doesn't make sense. I'm getting garbage out. So um, it depends on what you are looking at and what your application is. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Musai, for answering that. There is also another question. I'm going to direct this one to Owen McCarthy. Um, so how do we keep the algorithms produced via public funding free for advancing future AI developments in a world where increased governmental regulation, intellectual property rights, et cetera, are locking the code? Additionally, how do we keep healthcare prices down as if these algorithms are adding more costs? Yeah, thank you. So the second part of that question, you know, I think comes down to this really, that's more of a, almost a policy angle because the pr problem you often see in healthcare is people just add things and, and that, you know, because no one wants to lose anything, it, it, it's additive. However, you know, now in COVID has highlighted this, now that we can treat anyone wherever they are and like treat them per, in a personalized way and maybe even prevent, you should keep long-term healthcare costs down. And, and, and to do that, like the technologies will enable that to happen. And then it comes down to, you know, a, a, a policy angle for how then the healthcare systems adopt that. And, you know, that's, you know, that's um, a bit outside my pay grade for that one. You know, that's a, you know, and, and gets political real fast on how that can happen. But, but the, the technologies under themselves will make efficiencies and stop things from happening, you know, like, you know, or, or you can treat people earlier before they get um, things to happen. And so it should keep healthcare prices down, but, but it's going to require some, some swift policy work. And on the intellectual property side, you know, I think that's a place where, you know, you know, there's two things, you know, the, the, there's actually, if you're a software developer, um, you've in onto yourself um, over time said, um, we believe in the open source movement and that's how we build a lot of things. And we, we care about employers and places that can, that continue to do that. So I think that attitude will force it, companies from at least to at least keep some things from being locked down. Um, and then places like university of Maine play a huge role in that because you are, you, you're an institution and we're an institution that does research for the public good. Um, and, you disseminate that information through papers and other ways. And so there's a huge role for higher education to lead the charge in, in, in advancing the future in AI development. Thank you very much, Owen. Um, that's all the time we have for today. The rest of the question will be posted online. Again, I would like to thank all our panelists for uh, presenting the talks today. I also want to thank uh, the staff at the Office of Vice President for Research, uh, who have been running this in the background, Mindy, Tilan, and Liz, um, as well as search from uh, UMain IT to help us make sure there is no technical issues. Again, thanks to our sponsors and promoters of this event, IEEE from all over the world, our colleagues in California, uh, in Silicon Valley, in Boston section, as well as Bangalore in India and Shenzhen in China. I would like to invite everybody to attend our future AI webinars, first Thursday of the month at noontime Eastern time. 
Our next event is happening on November 5th, and the last one for the fall would be December 3rd, with more interesting talks to come. My name is Ali Obedi. I'm Assistant Vice President for Research at the University of Maine. I would like to thank everybody for joining us today um, and hope to see you in future events. Thank you and have a great day, everyone.